suffer any death you want, but help me to live long enough to be able to raise my children into faith. Her cancer went into remission, and I think Emily was about 20 at the time. Luke was 18. Her cancer came back, and so Kathleen passed away. So Emily came to the Fatima conference, and she says, I know my mother would want you to have this rosary. So we have the rosary of Jacinta here, and I'm going to be limited because I have to leave right after this talk. I've got to get to the airport, but uh, we'll just pass it around. you want to kiss it or pray a Hail Mary on it or something like that to be fine? The one and only request is, I want it back. <laughs> we'll start with you. You look like a, a, a safe customer here. The other thing, we asked for prayers. I got a call two days ago from Father Brendan Legg. His mom, Ann Legg, in New Zealand, had a very severe stroke, and she's not doing very well. If she survives, she'd be very handicapped. So if you can remember Ann Legg in your prayers. I remember first meeting Ann and Brendan Legg and Matthew Legg at the time. Father Dennis was there. This was in 1992. Uh, they were just boys. And... Uh, so he was just asking if you could please remember Ann Leg in your prayers. The other thing I'd like to just briefly talk about is with regard to where we are at and so far as, as a traditional movement. We're not the only ones who are practicing the Catholic faith, the traditional Catholic faith. There are other groups. We're not the Catholic faith. We're part of the Catholic Church, but we're not the Catholic Church. There are other, obviously, Catholics throughout the world, but... And so far as the work we're doing, uh, things are expanding very, very quickly. And I'd like to explain, if you'd bear with me just a moment. Uh, I know sometimes people think, you're getting overextended. You're going too many places. Well, there's a purpose and a reason for that. One is spiritual and the other is simply temporal. First thing is, is that opportunities come up where there's groups and traditional mass centers where they don't have a priest and they want us to come. And there's a need there. There's souls in need. The second thing is that we have seminarians who are coming up to the priesthood. And I remember reading this book. It's Pastoral Psychology and Practice by a, a Father Damal. He was a Benedictine priest. Excellent insofar as explaining human nature. And one of the things he says is that <clears throat> if a young priest is ordained and he's not challenged in his priesthood, he'll become very dissatisfied. You know, if he only has one Mass on Sunday, gives a sermon, a couple sick calls during the year, and one or two baptisms, one or two marriages, he'll become very dissatisfied. He's not challenged. In his youth, he wants to, you know, reach for the stars and become all he can become. And in order to achieve that, we have to have places for them to go. And I would just like to explain, you know, some of the places that we have now well established go back to the early days when we were having you know multiple masses on sunday and traveling you know great distances always in the back of my mind thinking eventually we're going to get priests here and this thing going to really grow so like as an example i remember there came there was a time in colorado we would drive from omaha to denver forgetting even how many hours it is what, seven hours, eight hours maybe? Eight hours, okay. So we have morning mass in Denver, afternoon mass in Colorado Springs, evening mass in Burlington, and drive back to Omaha for school on Monday. Crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. But eventually we have two priests now, one in Denver, Father Gregory Draymon and Friar Leon in Burlington, and they can both help out in Colorado Springs, and these places are growing. So that's the reason why we do what we do. Now, just to explain, there's three priests with me in Omaha. We have Father Geckel, uh, Timothy Geckel from Ohio. <clears throat> he was one of our students in our school and went to seminary. He drives about 11 hours to Arkansas. So he covers Arkansas and Tulsa, Oklahoma. He comes back. So 11 hours there, 11 hours back, 22 hours on the road every Sunday. Father uh, Stephen Sanquist, he's been going to school since you know, we had to school and he got ordained. Uh, Father Chrisoff remembers when he came, how many years ago were you visiting, Father Chrisoff? You were, uh, of course, Father Chrisoff is here, but we had our All Saints Day celebration, so the students were getting on the stage, they're dressed up in their costumes, and little Stephen Sanquist was up there 
dressed in his costume, getting a vote from the seminarians about how well his costume was, but now he's a priest. He goes to Oklahoma City, or Edmond, north of Oklahoma City, just nearby, and he also comes to Topeka. Father Borja, he went to school at our school, and he went up. He went to the seminary. He covers Minnesota and back every Sunday. Me, I have three masses on Sunday. I drive three hours to our other church and three hours back. And uh, you know, we're putting in a lot of hours and driving, but it's going to get better. And we have many other places that we can cover. Every year, there are more and more mass centers that are opening up. What I'm trying to say is, is this, uh, and I've told our priests this on multiple uh, priest meetings. It's very difficult for me to support the younger priest all out of Omaha. We don't generate from our parish or from our funds. We don't generate enough money. That's the reason why when I offer masses, I don't take any mass stipends. There's there's not the money to pay the bills. I don't take a stipend from the church. don't just take a stipend from the the school. don't take a stipend from the seminary. There's no money. So what I'm asking is, is this. I know that many of you do contribute to the seminary, Mater Dei Seminary, we greatly appreciate that. But I think that as our numbers have grown, etc., cetera, there are some of you who do not know about our newsletter. And it's not just to help support the seminarians, which we need. Their, we don't charge anything for the seminary. I don't want any young men saying, well, I can't go to that seminary because I can't afford it. The seminarians know when they come to Mater Dei, their education is free. But it's on condition that once they're ordained, they're going to work under me. And they're going to go where I tell them to go. So that's the understanding. Uh, not everybody makes it, but, you know, we have 15 seminarians uh, this year, and we have three to be ordained in, in December. If you'd like to go to the ordination, it's a pretty neat ceremony. We have sometimes as many as 20 priests there to help with the pontifical mass, to pose their hands. Very, very uh, inspirational uh, ceremony. But these deacons, you know, they're in this interim. They're not priests, so they're not offering mass, but they are doing you know, some of the work of the ministry, and uh, we have to support them. So if they have medical issues or this or that, and also as soon as they get ordained, we have to have cars for them, and they have places to go and things to do, but some of our mass centers are not that big. So it would be really appreciated, even if you gave 10 bucks, if there's 10 people gave 10 bucks, as $100 less that we don't have. So the email address that you could... Get on the newsletter. It's M-I-C-C, Mary Michael Catholic Church. First three letters of secretary at AOL.com. If you want the newsletter, send me a newsletter, and by contributing you get a mass offered for benefactors, and you're remembered in the divine office for this, with, when we pray the divine office with the priest, etc. So we really appreciate that help. But the thing is, is this. Uh, we have places for them to go. But we need to support them, and some of these places are just developing. I remember when I first came to Omaha in 1987, I think we had about 40 people there, and now we're up to about over 300, 350, whatever. And we've really expanded very well, and we have a church in O'Neill, Nebraska, St. Teresa's, St. Mary's, and Grand Island. And plus, it's become a hub. We can drive to, we have a mass center now in Illinois. Uh, We've expanded to Wisconsin, uh, two places in Minnesota. I didn't say that right, Minnesota. Okay, and uh, but, you know, I just want to say, too, with our priest and these upper coming priests, uh, we have vehicles that have 430, 440,000 miles on it. So we burn these cars. I mean, we tra- change the oil and we change the tires and all that stuff, but they're pretty high mileage cars or vehicles. So uh, it costs money to operate what we're doing. But like I say, some of our priests, even after they're ordained, if they're going to a place, etc. These places are developing. Uh, They're not able to generate the money that those priests need for support. We have to cover them with medical insurance. And it's only right that, you know, the labor is worthy of his hire, as Jesus said. So I think it's important that if you can, if you don't get our newsletter, M-I-C-C-S-E-C at A-L-L dot com. Uh, I'll tell you a a funny story, though. Uh, About 2.45 in the morning, phone's ringing, and I'm thinking, oh, somebody over at the seminary answered this phone. Because it rings in the rectory, rings in the seminary. I pick up the phone, and I hear this, this man. He says he's Rayfield from, and I, I couldn't pick it up. I said, what do you say? You're from where? He says, Uganda. Okay, okay, you're from Uganda. U- Uganda, okay. What can I do for you, Rayfield? He says, why don't I join the seminary? Okay, that's great. Say, this is our, our email address. 
send your information. Okay, thank you. Good night. He must have had no clue what time zone was. Two days later, phone's ringing. I'm looking, 2.45. Oh, it's, it's, it's Rayfield again. <laughs> Hello, Rayfield. What's going on? I want to join the seminar. Rayfield, I've heard this before. Now, please, M-I-C-C-S-C-C at AOL. Okay, send your information. Good night. Click. A couple days later, phone's ringing at 2.45. It says, I am not answering this phone. <laughs> please, somebody over at the seminar, talk to Rayfield. Okay. Rings, 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 rings. Okay, thank good. He stopped. Starts up again. Rings, rings, just nonstop rings. So, uh, interestingly, we get a lot of inquiries uh, insofar as seminary is concerned. We do have a seminarian from Australia. We have a seminarian from Scotland uh, and, and from Mexico and, and, and from England. So, we have uh, expanding places, etc. cetera, and uh, we're very excited. One of our deacons, he was a Novus Ordo priest from Vietnam, Father his name is Reverend Joseph Pham, and a uh, very humble man. I say he's about 41, 42 years old. Novus Ordo, going through his studies all over again. He'll be ordained as well, and uh, he does want to work in this country for a little bit before going back to Vietnam, uh, but very, very exciting things happening. We had uh, been in contact with a Jesuit priest, a Novus Ordo Jesuit priest. I won't say where he's from or what his name is, but he is very interested in what's going on in the church. He cannot hide the fact that there is being heresy being promulgated out of the Vatican, especially by Francis I. He's, he's very sharp, he understands, but he, emotionally and psychologically he's trying to wrap himself around how in the world could this have ever happened? I mean, but I said, you know, you can ask that question over and over again, you gotta face reality. It is what it is. We know what Christ has taught. We know what the Catholic Church teaches. These men are blatantly contradicting Christ and the church, church's teachings. It's not pretty. The consequences are very, very uh, uh, dismal to think we haven't had a pope for such a long time, etc. But it's the reality. And I like to go fall back onto the, the concept of the apostasy. St. Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians, second letter to Thessalonians chapter 2, this is read on the uh, Ember Saturday during Advent, where St. Paul says the day of the Lord, the second coming, will not come until the apostasy comes first and the man of sin is revealed. And he sits in the temple of God and gives himself as if he were God. And I'd like to comment on that. And that is that, you know, when we think of the Mass, the priest faces the tabernacle where Christ is present. He faces the crucifix. Wherever mass is offered, there's a crucifix. So he's facing the east with his back to the people. And that's all been replaced. The tabernacle where Christ is enthroned in the Eucharist has been taken out, and they set up a table, and right behind the table are the chairs. Where the tabernacle once stood, there's the presider chair. He sits in the temple of God in the place where Christ used to be worshipped. And if you stop and think of this, a priest, a true Catholic priest, is another Christ, an altar Christus. He represents Christ. Everything he does is very well regulated because the priest is not drawing attention to himself. So as an example, when it comes to the rubrics, the priest's hands are as far as the shoulders. When he says the Gloria, he doesn't go beyond his shoulders and outside the parameter of his shoulders. When he, when he sings Dominus Subiscum or says Dominus Subiscum, he has his eyes downcast. Everything is very well regulated, not to draw attention to himself, but he's Christ representative. And a very simple thing, too, is, is that we tell the seminarians about to be ordained a couple of simple rules before you touch the Blessed Sacrament, you always genuflect. Before you open up the tabernacle, when you open up the tabernacle, first thing you do is genuflect. The last thing you do before you close the tabernacle is genuflect. After you've touched the Blessed Sacrament, next thing you do is genuflect. The church is constantly reminding you of the presence of Christ. That's all gone. It's all done, been done away with. I remember telling you this story before, for some of you are new. I was flying to Cleveland, Ohio, sat next to this woman here and. She asked me what I was doing in Cleveland. I said, I got some work for the church. I said, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm going to a clown seminar. Oh, you're a professional clown. 
And uh, that's interesting. See, I entertain kids and this and that. She said, you want to know something? I said, no. What? She <laughs> says, most, most of the people that attend are either clowns or they're modern priests. I said, you got to be kidding me. She says, no, because now that the priest faces the people, he has to entertain them. And it's, it's the focus is on the man, not on who he represents. So if we stop and think of this, the priest is an altar Christus. But if a man is standing there and he's not validly ordained because they've changed the right of consecration of bishops in 1968, made it ambiguous, and the man is not really focusing your attention on Christ, he's not truly transubstantiating the Holy Eucharist, the bread and wine to the body and blood of Christ. And a lot of these modern priests, unfortunately, are preaching false ecumenism. You know, we should worship with other churches and religions. We all need to get together. Religious indifferentism, doesn't matter what church you go into or go to, all religions are fine and dandy. He's anti, anti Jesus, anti Christ. Am I saying these Novus Ordo priests are the Antichrist? No. But if you know, if you read in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24, when our Lord was asked by the apostles, uh, our Lord, the apostles said to Jesus, look at these beautiful buildings here in Jerusalem. And our Lord says, amen, I say to you, there won't be a stone left upon a stone. All this is going to be leveled. And Jesus' prophecy we know came true. The Romans surrounded Jerusalem, and instead of attacking them because Jerusalem's on a plateau, they'd have to fight uphill. Uh, General Titus and his officers said, we, le- we can take them. We're not going to lose too many men, so we're just going to starve them out. So they, as Christ had predicted, they encircled Jerusalem. The Jews were weakened by starvation and dehydration, and they cut off their water supply and food supply. And then they came in to destroy the city, and the temple was leveled. Not a stone was left upon a stone. But Jesus was then asked by his apostles, when will these things happen? And our Lord talks about not just the event of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, but also the end of the world. Now, the interesting thing is, is this. Our Lord talks about the abomination of desolation. And, and in the footnote, it talks about how in the time of Antichrist, the, the forerunners of Antichrist will try to destroy the real presence of Christ on earth by destroying the mass. Right in the footnote, this is the Haydock, Father George Haydock Bible. Uh, you know, it's the Douay Reims version of the Bible, but the, the footnotes and stuff have been gathered by uh, Reverend George uh, Haydock. And it says right in there, Luther was a forerunner of Antichrist by what he did in Germany, and so were the other reformers who destroyed the mass. So if that be true of them, in a, in a more, what would you say, a more restricted way, Germany, England, what is it today? These people are forerunners of Antichrist, destroying Christ's real presence throughout the world. So just to, you know, uh, something to be, to be considered is that we cannot underestimate uh, the circumstances and situation of the church today. And that's the reason why, uh, you know, people said, Bishop, you better slow down. I was thinking, you know what? We don't have a lot of time. We're very fortunate. We can still spread the faith publicly, and we're not in- prohibited, you know, up to this point. The time may come when we might be able to do what we're doing right now. So we want to get out there, want to establish churches, want to convert as many people as we can while we got the time. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. So wherever you can do to help out, you know, with the seminary, if you if you just send your address, you get on our mailing, and every little bit helps. I want to tell you a quick story here. Um, this is kind of funny. Uh, pertains to Father Legal. Is he here? Oh, there he is. There's a gentleman from Ireland, from Knock, Ireland, who came to the United States, wanted to get confirmation. And he was visiting a family in Ohio. So I said, well, listen, we have a mass center in Illinois, just uh, south west of Rockford, and uh, I'm going to go there. I'll, I'll meet you halfway. We have confirmation. So I'm talking to him. He has a really heavy Irish accent. So I said, yeah, you got an accent, but I can understand you. But Father Legault, he's kind of difficult to understand, you know. So he, t- he, says, he, he brightened up. He says, let me tell you something. He says, when I first met Father Legault, he was talking about the a samurai, the samurai priest. And he thought, 
these guys have swords, these Japanese swords, samurai, ah, you know. He said, spell it for me. And he spelled C-M-R-I. So we're the samurai priest. <laughs> I just had to tell you that. Uh, I got to tell you another real interesting quick story here, and that is uh, after Mass on Sunday, I'm, I'm, I have adult drachen class after two Masses, and I got to drive for Mass for a third Mass. This man stops me and says, Oh, Bishop, I have a question for you. Now, he's the father of a family. And I was going to walk up to him, and there's a young man standing next to him. And this young man had happened to be dating his daughter. And I said, well, I don't want to cut in front of him. He's going to ask you if he could marry your daughter. I'm just joking. <laughs> and I looked at him, he said, well, uh, Mr. So-and-so, uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, <laughs> that's exactly what I wanted to ask you. <laughs> Can I marry your daughter? As I spit it out, man, spit it out, you know. <laughs> so later he says, boy, thank you. I wasn't sure how to say that. <laughs> I mean, that's my guardian angel and our blessed mother telling me, you got to say this, got to say that. Another interesting story. Uh, I needed to contact somebody at another place in Colorado. I need to get hold of his family. So I, I, it was, I thought, oh, this, they just finished Mass, but... Maybe people left, so I called the convent there, asked sister to look out the window and see if their family's still there, and, hey, tell them, I, I need to talk to them. So sister looks out the window, and everyone's gone except for a young man kneeling on one knee and putting a ring on this girl's finger. And sister's like, I better not look. <laughs> <laughs> no sooner had he done that, I get a call, and I say, hey, Tyson, what's up? He said, what are you doing on Saturday and such and such month? I said, hey, congratulations. You tell Genevieve, really happy for both of you. You name the date, I'll be there, you know, for the wedding. So congratulations, great. And we'll start instructions next time I go out there. So I get off the phone with him, phone rings. Sister says, right off the bat, I know something you don't know. <laughs> I said, oh, Tyson's getting married to Genevieve? <laughs> How did you know that? Because he just called me, and I was on the phone with him. She says, well, I saw it. <laughs> Can I tell you one other story real fast, okay? <laughs> you know, we got to do this because if, if, if I get into the conference, you're going to be nodding off, and, and then I lose you. So if we start out and you're kind of excited. Uh, I don't have a lot of time in life. I don't take a time for a vacation, but I do take some times when people visit. We might take them out for a fishing trip for an afternoon or whatever. I won't mention any names to save people's reputation. But to a certain gentleman, he was visiting out of town with his boys, <clears throat> out of state. And long and short of it is, you know, I had told him when I had confirmations out there that it's, a, it's really a lot of fun to shoot fish with a bow and arrow. We do it with the seminarians. We do it with the border boys and girls. They have a great time. So he was saying, hey, can we do that? I said, sure. So his boys are in canoes, and then he and I are in his boat, and his seven-year-old son's in between us. And we have this pretty small boat, electric motor, but you can get right up onto the fish, and you got Polaroid glasses you can see right into the water, and we're shooting fish. It's just, we're having a great time. The one thing this man does not have is he doesn't have balance. <laughs> so twice he fell backwards, almost smashed his son. And, he, and he's, he's a very stout man. He's about, I'm guessing, 240, 250. <laughs> we're on the other side of the lake, and all of a sudden he tips the boat. We just completely flip over because he lost his balance. It dumped everything. Uh, but our, our lady was teaching me humility because, you know, what we do is we kind of have an unspoken, you know, who got the biggest fish. So Brother Thomas had the record at one point at 37 inches or whatever. Then I shot one. <laughs> so we took the boys and girls out right before school let out. And I caught, I shot a 38-inch fish. And then, I don't know if you know the Messiases. Are there Messiases here today? Okay, well, Flora Messias, 38 and a quarter inches. <laughs> okay, well, we forgive her, okay? <laughs> so when I'm with this fella and his, his son, and his boys, are, they're out there in the canoes, but in this boat, 
I shoot one way bigger, probably 42, 43 inch fish. I'm thinking, this is the record until he tipped the boat. <laughs> <laughs> so fortunately there was a log. So I grabbed onto the log and I'm holding onto the boat so it doesn't sink. And this is a story because, you know, St. Anthony, I have a great devotion to St. Anthony. My father's name was Walter Anthony, oldest brother Richard Anthony, Dale Anthony, Wayne Anthony, I'm Mark Anthony, my little brother Anthony. So, I mean, we're really devoted to St. Anthony. He dumps everything. I mean, just, I mean, we just lost everything. We lost the motor. It was an electric motor. We lost the battery. Uh, we lost a buck with all the fish. We lost our bows. We lost our arrows. We lost everything. So I said, you know, you're going to have to dive down, at least get that bucket, because there's no way we can get this boat back to shore. So I'm holding on to the log, holding on to the, the boat. I said, first, let's get this boat on the, on, the, on the log. So we get it on, we flip it over. I told the son, seven-year-old son, you get in the boat. I know it's full of water. It's about this full of water. Start, when your dad, if he can find the bucket, we start bailing. Now, it's deep and it's dark. So, you know, he's down there in bubbles and bubbles and bubbles, and then he comes up with the, with the bucket. I said, yes. So I gave him the bucket, start bailing, kid. He dives down again, and all of a sudden, I see the motor come up. Hey, grab the motor. You know, like, <laughs> put that in the boat. You know, it's still full of water. We're just sticking things in there because now it's right set up. Then the battery comes. I'm like, out of the blue, to grab the battery, <laughs> throw that in there. And then the bow start coming up. We emptied out all the water of the bo- boat. We got the, the motor and the, the, uh, the battery connected. We went back to fishing. And I was thinking, that's remarkable because if we would have gone another two feet, that was the drop-off. It would have been, who knows, 20, 25 feet, never found anything. We would have lost everything, and I don't even know if we would have made it back to shore or not. But St. Anthony really comes through when you need him. And I was just thinking, dear God and St. Anthony, <laughs> that was a, a disaster we completely avoided. And I can't thank St. Anthony enough for the times he has intervened. So really, want to, I, I, I think I owe it to St. Anthony. Pray to St. Anthony if you lose something. St. Anthony really comes through when you need him in a pinch. Okay. What I wanted to speak of this morning, a number of topics, but the main topic we're going to talk about is our Blessed Mother. And when we think of divine revelation, St. Pius X said that the surest signs of the divine origin of Christianity are miracles and prophecies. Now, he also says, St. Pius X says, that miracles and prophecies are good for all times, all ages, all people. No matter how long the world goes, no matter where you're at in the world, if you look at the miracles of Christ, the, the prophecies he fulfilled, the prophecies he made that were fulfilled, you have the evidence that this is the religion revealed by God. Now, for me, the more I study scripture, the more I study prophecies and study Christ and his teachings and as such, you're overwhelmed by the omniscience of God, that God knows everything. He knows the past. He knows the present. He knows the future. He knows everything. Now, what's interesting is when we think of God creating the angels, we know he put the angels to a test. We don't know exactly for sure what that test was, but some theologians They speculate that the test was that God revealed to the angels that the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, would become man, that he would take to himself a body and a soul, that he would take a nature lower than that of the angels. And Satan and the rebellious angels would reject that, non serviam. Very interestingly, When we look at the first reference of Our Lady in Scripture, we come to Genesis 3.15. This is called the Proto-Evangelium because it's the announcing, the first announcing, Proto, first announcing of the Gospel. And interestingly, you have to look at what God is saying. Adam had sinned. His fall came about with the cooperation of a woman. Now God is speaking to Satan. And he says, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush thy head. 
Now, have you ever wanted to kind of, maybe some of you parents do this with your kids, you're you going to warn them about something, you're not going to show all your cards. And I think this is the case with God to Satan. You know, Satan, a woman's going to come, she's going to crush your head. I'm not going to say who she is and when she's coming and how it's going to happen, but that's what's going to happen. Think about that, Satan. You know, ponder that. I, 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 think of, I think of how oftentimes you don't show all your cards, but you throw something out and get people thinking about something. Now, with this case, God establishes the enmity between the woman and Satan. Between her seed and his seed. Now, this is the interesting point. Some scriptures say, and he shall crush thy head. Some say, she shall crush thy head. And others say, it shall crush thy head. Now, why is there a discrepancy? He, she, it. It's because in the Hebrew, we find in Genesis 3.15, the Hebrew words were right at big, These Hebrew words, this actually means she. This here means it's, a, it's the masculine verb, which means he shall crush. Why did Moses... Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Why did he join a feminine pronoun, she, to a masculine verb, he? That's the reason why we have these different translations. Now, interestingly, before we get into particulars, the Jews had a very scholarly man by the name of Mamonides, he lived in the 1100s in he was considered one of the most intellectual of all the Jews of all times, most scholarly. Now he is a Jew. He does not believe Jesus was the Messiah. He doesn't believe in Our Lady or anything in the Catholic faith. He's a Jew. He's writing a commentary on Genesis and what is this Jewish Scholar, this Hebrew scholar translate, he translate, she shall crush. Now, how do we explain what Moses had done? There is a Jesuit scholar who wrote 400 years ago. His name is Father Cornelius Alapide. We use him for sacred scripture. And he writes how I'll put his name down. Oh, by the way, his commentaries are translated into English. If you really want an in-depth study of sacred scripture, use him. I remember telling this to the priest quite a few years ago, and I said, you know, if you're going to have a sermon the coming Sunday, look him up, because he's going to tell you what St. Augustine, St. Ambrose all the fathers of the church would say he draws this and that and, and whatever. And I remember visiting one of our mass centers and some of the people saying, oh, Father's sermons are so well-researched. I can't, I can't believe it, the stuff he's coming out with. Yeah, it's, this, this, this man here. Okay, well, he says this was not by accident that Moses did this because he is showing that she by and through her seed, Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, through her seed, Jesus, will crush the head of Satan. So by and through him, she will crush his head. 
That's the, the understanding and the translation, etc. Now, interestingly, too, when we think of God foretelling this, we also have many other quotes from uh, the Old Testament that are just absolutely positively wonderful. Now, I, wanna, I wanted to say this. If you look at the Old Testament and see the prophecies made about Christ, it is absolutely, positively amazing. In fact, St. Augustine says there's a reason why God allows the Jewish people and the Jewish religion to continue on earth. You know, the Romans, when they came into Jerusalem in 70 AD and destroyed Jerusalem, they killed about a million Jews. They took 90,000 of them to Rome. The slaves, the captives from, the Jewish captives from Jerusalem to Rome, they built the Colosseum. But interestingly, St. Augustine says that the Jews, by believing in the Old Testament and continuing to verify the, this is their, these are their sacred books of the Old Testament, indirectly they're supporting Christ because it is so clear for an open mind when you look at the Old Testament, it so much points to Jesus that pagans would say, oh, you Christians, you wrote that book. You came up with that stuff and then made it fit Christ's life. No, they, St. Augustine says the Jews can't do that. Or, excuse me, the pagans can't do that because the Jews who don't accept Christ as the Messiah, they still verify the Old Testament. Now, I want to give you a, just a, a quick example here. I'm just going to put down a couple of Old Testament prophets, people who prophesied. Okay, we only listed here eight prophets. Now, I was driving one time late at night. Most of the time, I come back to my third mass. If you want to get a hold of me because you need something to talk about, call me. Because I'll, I'll talk to you and give you your answers, and you'll keep me awake. Okay, so I take most phone calls on the way and the way back on Sunday. And when I don't take a phone call, I'll, I'll listen to some type of intelligent talk radio. Well, there's a guy out of Cincinnati, Bill Cunningham. Anybody heard of Bill Cunningham? Okay, pretty good guy. Not always, but he's Nova Sordo. But he was saying, and in our next segment, over the break, we're going to talk to an individual who's going to talk about, about the math of Jesus. And I'm thinking, the math of Jesus? Math sounds weird, real weird. Now, this is the point. It wasn't anything that expected. He was saying, if you just took eight prophets, these are eight men, and what these men are going to do is they're going to talk about one individual. They're speaking between 500 and 1,000 years before Christ. And they're going to say, when he comes, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, that's going to happen. Micchaeus, he'll be born in Bethlehem. Aegeus, the, the temple will be standing, second temple will be standing. Jacob, Judah and his sons will rule Israel, and when the scepter is taken away from Judah and his ascendants, the Messiah will come. That's exactly what happened before the coming of Christ. The Romans conquered the Jews. They put Herod over the Jews. The scepter had passed. Daniel the prophet, we've spoken about this before, he says when they start to rebuild Jerusalem, when they announce it, at the rebuilding of Jerusalem, there will be 69 weeks of years till the public appearance of the Messiah. Now, when did they announce the rebuilding of Jerusalem? Daniel the prophet didn't know that. He's just saying when they announce it, so many years later, the Messiah is coming. It was in 453 B.C. But if you do your math, 69 times 7, you come up with 483 years. That comes up to be 30 A.D., the public appearance of the Messiah. Pretty cool. Isaiah, we're going to speak about Isaiah later, but he talks about how when the Messiah comes, he will work miracles. Isaiah says this, God himself will come and save you. 
Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the, the, the deaf be unstopped and the, 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 the dumb will speak, the tongue will be unloosed, and the lame man's going to leap like the heart. Exact miracles that Christ did. Isaiah also said, and we're going to get into this later, a, a, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Something wonderful is going to happen. A virgin going to conceive and bear a son. His name is going to be called God with us. We have David the prophet. He said, when the Messiah comes, he'll be a priest like Melchizedek, offering bread and wine and sacrifice. Then we have Jeremiah speaking about the passion of Christ. And Osi talking about how the Messiah will have to flee to Egypt and then come back from Egypt again. But look, we're only talking about eight, eight prophets. What is the probability, and this is what this man was talking about, what is the probability that these eight individuals writing at different times in different places, what is the probability that all of these prophecies are fulfilled by one person? Well, he gives the humble an estimate. It would be 10 to the 17th power. That means 10 with 17 zeros at the end of it. But it gets even bigger than that. And that is if you took all the prophecies of the Old Testament that all came perfectly converging on Christ, you're at like 10 to the 50, 157 zeros at the end of it. Literally, absolutely impossible. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but 10 to the 17th power. How can we visualize that? We take, how many, anybody, anybody from Texas? Anybody from Texas? Okay, we know Texas is big, right? Oh, there you are, okay. Texas is big. Everything in Texas is big. If you covered all of Texas with two feet of silver dollars, the whole state of Texas, two feet of silver dollars, and you marked just one single silver dollar out there, and you blindfolded somebody, and he could walk through that pile you know, all around Texas, and he reaches into the pile and says, ah, I got the marked one. That's the probability of only eight people speaking about one person, and it all comes true. So if we're only looking at 10 to the 17th power, man, and what a likelihood of finding a, a silver dollar mark two feet deep all over, the, all over the state of Texas. We know it's impossible. But then you magnify that by all the prophecies made about Christ. That it just blows your mind. There is no way that those men could have known and spoken so specifically that he would ride on a donkey coming into Jerusalem. He'd be betrayed by one of his own. His side would be pierced. His hands and feet would be pierced. He'd be spit upon, scourged, crowned with thorns. How do these men know these things and speak in such great... It was God's revealing to them. And you know the cool thing about all this? It doesn't matter. It's 2019. It doesn't matter. Anybody with an open mind who looks at divine revelation say... You can't argue that. That's, that's, it's true. There was an atheist. In fact, I think the man who did this math of Jesus, he was an atheist. But he started to ponder these things and investigate these things, and he led to say, there has to be a God. There's no way that these men could have all known this. But that's just the prophecies. As we know, the miracles of Christ, very simply, the miracles of Christ are just so wonderful, there would be no way that the, the apostles and disciples could have lied about such extraordinary events. They were going to try to convert the world to Christ. Now, first and foremost, we look at the apostles. Our Lord chose the most incompetent and the most, how would you say, unqualified. And he did this for a reason. These simple country bumpkin fishermen from Galilee, and he tells them, convert the world. Why did he do that? Because he was going to show that this was the work of God, not the work of man. Aided by the Holy Ghost and Christ said, I'll be with you all days. The faith was spread, but the apostles were armed with truth. When they spoke about he raised Lazarus from the dead, those people were contemporary. You can go to Bethany. You can see, talk to the people, and they boldly said he raised Lazarus from the dead in Bethany. And what did his enemies, the Pharisees, do? They couldn't do anything. In fact, you know, last year we studied the Talmud with the seminarians to know what the Jews have carried down, what they've said about Christ. Blasphemous things against Christ, blasphemous things against Our Lady. I told the seminarians, we read you know, this, this documentary from start to finish. I said, did they say anywhere in their attacks on Christ and Mary, our Blessed Mother, did they anywhere say he didn't do these miracles? No. 
I said, why? They were trying to discredit him. If those miracles never happened, that would have been the first thing to say, oh, you bunch of liars. Never happened. Why did his enemies who hated him want to discredit him, why did they not attack in that area? They didn't attack in that area because they couldn't. His miracles were public and witnessed by many, many people. And that stands as a fact from here on. You can't deny the miracles of Christ, that these are historically proven events. And you can't lie about those things. If those events never happened, if the apostles were a bunch of liars and, or fraud, Christianity would have never spread. Not only that, but you stop and think of this. Our Lord's greatest event is his resurrection from the dead. When he died on the cross, as St. Paul said, if Christ would have never risen, that would have been the end of Christianity. Who is going to follow you know, a crucified man who was discredited and whatever? No, he rose as he said he would. And his apostles and disciples saw this. Over 500 brethren saw this. They shed their blood for the reality that he had risen from the dead. And not only that, but as Christ had foretold to his apostles, you have the power that I have. St. Peter and St. John go up to the temple. There's a guy begging there. He's crippled. Gold and silver I have not, but what I have to thee, I give to thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise and walk. That made such a big stir stir in Jerusalem. So the apostles had the ability to work miracles. The gift of tongues. They could speak in their own native tongue, and everybody, whatever country they were from on that first Pentecost day, understood them. So we have the hand of God here. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. No question in our minds about it. So why do we say these things? We say these things because, and we're going to get back to Our Lady real quickly, but we say these things because God has revealed one religion through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That one religion is the Catholic faith. And it's not for man to tell God, you know, you've done this. You made all these prophecies, inspired all these men. You sent the Son of God into the world. He became man. He died on the cross. He founded the church. He instituted the seven sacraments. And you know what? God, I'm going to do it my way. That, it, that No, you, do, you're not, you can't do it your way. God has told us the way it's supposed to be. It's not for you to pick and choose. I mean, you have a free will to reject God, begin to pay the consequences. But the point I'm making is, it is totally erroneous, false, to say all religions are good. The Buddhists are good, the Hindus are good, the Muslims are good, etc., etc. That is totally, absolutely erroneous. Those are false religions. Those are religions man-made. Now, why do we stress this? Because, my dear friends, this is the error of the modern conciliar church. Vatican II, we've, you, some of you old-timers heard this and you think, man, has he ever beaten a dead horse? Well, yeah, we're going to keep beating it, okay? Because the dead horse keeps, you know, you can still smell it. And it's, the flies are still there. Keep beating it, okay? 50 years later after Vatican II. Vatican II, uh, Nostra Aetate, said in our times, Declaration on the Relation of the Church to Non-Christian Religions, they praised the Hindus, they praised the Buddhists, they praised the Muslims. In Dignitatis Humanae, the decree on religious liberty, it says man has the right to worship God any way he wants. That's condemned. Man has the obligation to seek the truth, to find divine revelation and accept it. Now, it doesn't mean that man doesn't have a free will. God gives a free will, but man does not have a right to tell God, I'm going to do it my way and heck with you, and I can reject all this. It's the same thing with regard to Protestantism. You know, sometimes in the modern church they say, well, and this is a part of the errors of Vatican II, very subtle, by the way. Pope Pius XII, in his encyclical Mystic Corpus Christi, the mystical body of Christ, said, the one true church of Christ is the Catholic Church. Is the Catholic Church. Vatican II took the word is out and said subsist. The one true church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. And what do they mean by that? Yeah, it's, it's there in the Catholic Church, but it's also in other churches as well. They, they cross that line that the one true church of Christ is not exclusively the one you know, the Catholic Church, but it's outside that Catholic Church. And so that's the reason why we know when Pope Pius the 
ninth in his syllabus of error, he condemned the idea that Protestantism is just as good as Catholicism, and all men can worship God any way they want. That's all stuff that's been condemned. You stop and think with regard to the Protestants, and God will judge them. But how do you explain John 1, 20, 21, 22, 23? Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I send you. Receive the Holy Ghost whose sins you forgive. They are forgiven. I mean, Protestants can bark all they want. I'm going to only talk to God. I'm not talking to no man. Were well, you telling me that you can reject what Jesus has done? you telling me that Jesus wasted his time? you telling me you believe in the Bible? Where are you coming from, Mac? What is this all about? Jesus established the sacrament of confession. The early church, the early Christian writers wrote about confession, and you reject that. Another one, interestingly, is the Holy Eucharist. You know, the Protestants believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven, and if any eat of this bread, he'll live forever. The Jews said, this is a hard saying. Who can, who can, who can swallow this? Jesus emphatically said, Amen, amen, I say to thee, unless you eat of the flesh of the man, Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. My flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. The Jews said, Forget this. And they left him. They left him. Did our Lord say, hey, wait a minute. You can misunderstand. I went, no, literally, come on back. I didn't, you misunderstood. What I, he didn't say any of that. He let them go. And so for the Protestants to read John chapter 6, how do they explain that? How do you explain that Jesus said, literally, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in me? The Jews left him, and he let him go. And yet the the Protestants say, I don't believe that. How could he be present? Ah, I can't understand that. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in what he's revealed? Do you believe he said, this is my body, this is the chalice of my blood? You don't. So my point is, is that it's very important for us to be strong in our faith. There is a book in the bookstore, and I'm not getting any revenue from this advertisement, It's called The Ten Reasons by Father Edmund Campion. Now, Edmund Campion was a Jesuit priest during the reign of terror against the Catholics in England under Elizabeth, the illegitimate daughter of Henry VIII and uh, Anne Boleyn. And the interesting thing is that people told Father Edmund Campion, you know, if you get eventually arrested, you know what they're going to do? They're going to put you in prison and say, Edmund Campion retracted. He said, reject the Church of Rome, reject the Pope, reject the Catholic faith. You have to be Protestant, English Protestant. They might do that. So they encourage them in Campion, write something up so that when this happens, we say, no, 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 this is what he wrote. So what Edmund Campion did, he wrote the Ten Reasons. It's beautiful because he quotes from Scripture proving the Catholic faith to be the true faith. He quotes from the early Christian writers, the fathers and doctors of the church. He quotes from history, historical facts, like the continuity. St. Peter had successors, Linus, Anacletus, Clement, and so on. He quotes from the councils of the church. How do you explain that there was a council of the church in 325 A.D., and that council said, I believe, in one holy Catholic apostolic church? So, interestingly, they were really prepared that if he ever gets caught, we're going to circulate this. So they got to these, these um, in hiding, they printed all, all his copies of, the, of his little book, The Ten Reasons. So he wrote it in Latin, has been translated since in English. But then some maybe overzealous man just start passing it out. And in fact, they didn't pass it out. They put it in all the churches throughout England all at once. So the Protestant clergy, not real clergy at all, wake up and all of a sudden they got the Ten Reasons. And everyone's talking about the Ten Reasons. They were ripping mad. But they actually, I think it was providential, it got circulated far earlier than they, they had anticipated, but it totally caught them off guard, and that was all the more reason why Edmund Campion's going to die. And he was, he's one of the English martyrs. But, you know, when it comes to our faith, I just, wanted, I just can't say enough how important it is that we be fortes and fide, as St. Peter says in his epistle, be strong in the faith. We have the truth on our side. The evidence is there. The facts are there. 
And it's not just for us to be able to argue with people. Hi, I got you. You got put you wrong, huh? No. It's for us to live that faith. And not just live that faith, but also to be able to explain it to others. Because God wills all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the faith. That's the reason why we have to steady our faith. We've got to know it. Now, getting back to Our Lady, we talked about uh, the, the Proto-Evangelium, uh, Genesis 3.15. What's also interesting, too, our Lord in the Gospel, we read in the chapters 2 of St. John, the wedding feast of Cana, and also John chapter 19, two times Mary, Mary is referred to by Jesus as the woman the woman who God has established as the enmity between Satan. Now, this is really interesting. When I was talking to one Protestant on a plane, and we got into this point, I was saying to him, look it, if we draw a parallel, and the early fathers of the church did this, one of them was as early as 150 A.D., St. Justin he draws this parallel between Eve and Mary. Okay, Eve was a virgin, because it says in Scripture that Adam did not know Eve up to this point, and our Blessed Mother was a virgin. We have a fallen angel, Satan, appear to Eve, and we have the angel Gabriel appear to Mary. We have the fallen angel encouraging pride and disobedience. Your eyes will be open. You should be likened to God. And we have humility and submission, obedience to the will of God. Eve approaches the, the forbidden fruit, the forbidden tree, And Mary approaches the tree of the cross. St. Justin, an apologist, martyr, in 150 speaks of this, and so do the early fathers of the church, that Mary is indeed the new Eve. Just as God created Eve without sin in a state of grace, so Mary was, was conceived without sin and full of grace. You see this wonderful parallel, though, and how, interestingly, when we recite the office in honor of Our Lady, if you take Eve's name in Latin, Eva, and you turn it around, it means Ave. So that's in the Ave Maristella, how that, what Eve had done, Mary had reversed. And what a wonderful thing. Satan thought he was pretty sharp, pretty clever. He brought about the fall of man through a woman. And God is going to reverse and bring about the redemption of man through another woman. That's the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, when we think of our Blessed Mother as the enmity between Satan, we're especially reminded in our times, uh, these are very, very difficult times indeed. No times for being la di da in our faith. If you're not really living your faith and practicing the faith, as the times get more and more immoral, and maybe our faith is going to be more and more challenged, and I mean in a way that we have never perhaps suspected. I remember um, thinking with regard to this, just one example out of many that we can give, but this idea of, of uh, how would you say, discrimination and hate crime and all this other stuff. Like if some man thinks he's a woman or some woman thinks they're a man and you don't use the proper you know, transgender pronoun for them, that you can, oh, you're, hate, you're hateful and you're this and that and all other stuff. And some people are actually getting, losing their jobs, getting fired. Uh, there's court cases, oh, you're discriminating against them, et cetera, et cetera. Bring to, oh, you don't want to make a, a cake for two gay men in Colorado. Well, you're going to pay the consequences. You're going to pay thousands of dollars in, in court fees and fines, and you're going to have to be reeducated. I mean, that's the society. We're on the verge of all that happening. Now, I don't want to get diverted off the attention of Our Lady, but I do want to say something. I, I think it's important that we know, especially young people, you know, some of you think, oh, what do you say to all that stuff? Well, it's simple. God has established an order, 
and it's for man to recognize the order established by God and follow that order. And not only the sacred scripture tell us this, that the effeminate, meaning homosexuals, will not inherit the kingdom of God. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality, but also just on a purely, from just using our reason, from ethics, God has established an order, and it's up for a man to recognize that order. We're not animals, we're human beings. And God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, okay? And that's, that's just the way it is. And a grave disorder will come if homosexuality would be acceptable. And you know, if we, don't, if we reject God's order, then there is no limit to how perverse and ridiculous and obscene and, ob, uh, you know, and, and, and absurd things can get. And that's what's happening today. It is getting to, to the point of absurdity. And you know that the tragedy is not only the media, but a lot of these big corporations, they're forcing it down everybody's throat, whether it's your workers or this or that. You have the, you know, remember President Obama passed that ridiculous law that if someone's a transgender, if a boy thinks he's a girl, he can use the woman, the woman or the girl's restroom or showers and vice versa. And if any school, public school, does not uphold that, they'll lose their federal funding. And so, you know, Charlotte had passed that, you know, they, we're not going to have this in our state with this, this transgender business. The NBA pulled out of there and said, well, we're not going to have the NBA championship there as a punishment for you not giving these rights. This is crazy stuff that we're living in, crazy times. This state of Washington, I mean, I asked Father Kazan, what's the law? He said, the law is that. If someone thinks, a boy thinks he's a girl, he can go in a girl's restroom. I said, anything like that happens, you throw them out. You you. Bring it on. We'll fight it because we're not going to put up with immorality and indecency. And it's, it's absolutely crazy. You know, what I think, and please don't get me wrong. I want to, we're going to back to Our Lady. But I think it's really funny when you have these male athletes who think they're women competing in, ma- in female sports. You know, these women in the Olympics weightlifting and this, this guy built like a guy, long hair, breaks all records. And oh, isn't he proud of himself because he beat all these women. What a joke. What a joke. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Crazy. Absolutely, positively crazy stuff. So getting back to the times in which we live, very dangerous times. And as you know, what, a five, ten years ago, you think, there's no way this is going to happen. Oh, t- can't. And it's happening. You think, what world am I living in? What is going on? And you know what's the, the other preposterous thing is it's even being done in the name of the Catholic Church. You got Francis I appointing pro-gay cardinals and, and recognizing priests who are openly for gay marriages and such like that. This is, this is it's, it is so black and white. These guys are phonies. These men are frauds. And it's, it's ridiculous to try to justify or excuse Oh, maybe don't know better. Maybe they're materially a heretic. You know, adulterers can go to Holy Communion. What? I mean, you're living in a state of public sin, breaking the commandment of God, and you can go to communion? Who does this guy think he's fooling? Francis I, this Bergoglio guy. And he's a fraud. This is not the Catholic faith. It's exactly what the enemies of the church said they were going to do.